Good afternoon, distinguished guests. Thank you for joining TMA ESD series. Today is our first event under the theme, The State of Green Finance. My name is Natnisha Shantautit. It's my pleasure on behalf of TMA to welcome you on board. First and foremost, before we start, I would like to invite Ms. Wanwira Rashidawong, Chief Executive Officer of TMA Thailand Management Association to give us the welcome speech. Well, good afternoon and welcome to the fourth activities in our ESG series, which is organized by TMA in collaboration with AWR Lloyd. On behalf of TMA, I would like to thank you for joining us today and for your interest in this sustainable development journey. We have talked about the crisis in risk management, the climate change and net zero in the previous two sessions. And this time we'll be learning how organizations from various industries have attracted investors, enhanced company reputation and increased equity while making this world greener with green financing. I believe it could not be more timely to bring this green finance agenda to your attention today. I'm therefore thankful for the speakers who kindly spared a valuable time to be with us today. Kun Yong Yutse, who we watch from Thai Union Group, Mr. Cedric Remote from Climate Bonds Initiative, and Mr. Aris Samaris from AWR Lloyd Australia. I would like to once again thank the team from AWR Lloyd for working with us on this worthy series. Thank you and please enjoy the discussion. Well, thank you, Kunwan Vera, for the welcome speech. Next, I would like to introduce our first speakers who will introduce and clarify the significance of the green finance instrument to the business sector. Please join me welcome Ms. Akrati Sukresha, Senior Associate of AWR Lloyd Thailand. Please welcome. Thank you, Kunatnicha, for the introduction and thank you for having me today. Today, I will be covering green and sustainable finance and its market overview. I'd like to start by defining what green and sustainable financing actually looks like. So these include instruments, fixed income instruments that are designed specifically to address environmental and social impact projects, some of which we will be discussing today. So green bonds are instruments which raise capital and invest in projects with positive outcome. Uh, social bonds are similar, but they focus on positive social outcome. And sustainability bonds are a mix of green and social bonds. And finally, SBL or sustainability linked bonds, which are debt instruments and their financial uh, characteristics are associated with their ESG performance. So how successful are these instruments globally and in ASEAN? Green bonds have uh, grown steadily since 2015 up till 2020, uh, both globally and in ASEAN. However, social and sustainability bonds uh, do not did not enjoy the same type of growth until 2019. So in 2019, from 2020, they grew tremendously, which will mostly be attributed to COVID-19. Uh, the majority of proceeds for all of this bonds go to renewable energy and green buildings for both global market and even in ASEAN. And the top issuer of green bonds worldwide is United States as of now. Uh, zooming into Thailand, we can see that Thailand issued its first green bond in 2015. After a short break, it picked up again in 2018. And in 2020, we saw a growth rate of more than 350%. Zooming into how the use of proceeds of these bonds are being used, we can see that the majority of green finance proceeds go towards uh, clean transportation, renewables, employment generation, circular economy. And the companies that you can see below are either the largest or the sole issuer of that particular bond. And in Thailand, Ministry of Finance is the largest issuer of such bonds. Now taking a step back, uh, we will look at what are the benefits and some of the controversies related to green finance. So one of the most obvious benefit is the reputational benefit. So it enhances the company's reputation. It confirms its sustainability commitment. It also gives issuer access to a broader range of investors in a regular bond. So this is also increasing uh, investor demand and also their diversification for companies. 
and it gives companies uh, to able that companies gives gives companies a chance to manage climate change at hand as well. And companies also benefit from a greater transparency through reporting the use of proceeds. And now I'd like to move on to some of the controversies that are related to green financing, and I will be highlighting two of them today. Uh, the, there was some allegation made, made against CLP's framework where their proceeds were going towards coal and natural gas fired, fired power plants. And these actually go against the definition of a green bond. Meanwhile, uh, Repsol used their green bonds to reduce the GHG emissions of their oil and gas assets. While this is acceptable as a transition bond, it's certainly not what a green bond would be defined as. And I'll shortly be talking about what transition bonds are. As I mentioned before, COVID-19 accelerated the issuance of social bonds from $16 billion to $165 billion from 2019 to 2020. And this was to mainly address the unforeseen economic and social disruptions caused by the pandemic. Now, going forward post-2020, as the UN states, we are in the decade for action against poverty, climate change, inequality, environmental degradation. Hence. We need to mobilize finance towards achieving UN SDGs or the Sustainable Development Goals. And ASEAN in specific needs to invest an additional $1.5 trillion annually to achieve Sustainable Development Goals by 2030. We, and we strongly believe that this market is set to grow in the next decade. And some of the tra uh, trends that we're noticing is that we think transition finance, such as sustainability-linked products, which will include sustainability-linked loans and sustainability-linked bonds, and transition bonds uh, are going to be gaining momentum. We think, um, so let me just give you a quick definition of this. what this is. Transition finance is similar to a green finance, except they carry no restriction on how the proceeds will be used, and this offers the so-called so hard to abate borrowers uh, more flexibility to tap into this market. And the other uh, major trend that we're noticing is that we see a convergence of SDG outcomes with these bonds. We believe that SDG outcomes will become more prominent as a way to measure sustainability performance in regards to SLL or SBL. So what does the green financing issuance value chain actually looks like? Uh, first and foremost, a company needs to have a coherent ESG strategy or else they run the risk of greenwashing. And once a company has decided what kind of green finance they would like to issue, let's say a green bond or a social bond, they should then move on to developing a green finance framework. Now this fr uh, framework should also include how are they going to use the proceeds, uh, what is the project selection process? How are they going to manage the proceeds? And what is the reporting going to look like post issuance? And an external review. An external review is generally helpful when a company uh, wants to validate their credentials of the framework and also the eligibility of its underlying projects. Now, once the internal processes are set and we have decided what sort of uh, green finance we would like to issue, uh, the company is set to issue a bond through an underwriter. Now, post issuance, the company should monitor and report annually the allocation of proceeds. They should also uh, uh, report balances of any unallocated proceeds and track KPIs and goals which are related to the bond and seek for external review. This review can uh, serve as an extra assurance that the proceeds are being allocated to the correct underlying projects. So these five steps will give you an overview of our best practice recommendation in issuing green finance. And I hope my presentation has helped you clarify the what and how of green and sustainable financing. Thank you for listening to me today. Thank you very much, Ms. Akrati Sukrisha. Well, before we start, if you have any question during the presentation, you can send it to us through Q&A function on the upper right corner of the screen. Our speaker will be pleased to answer them during the Q&A session. And we also have a polling question. So you have the opportunity to participate in the panel discussion as well. We have prepared five interesting questions about green finance, and you can choose your most interested topic by clicking the polling links and below image. And our first speaker for this session, please join me welcome Mr. Cedric Rimmel. 
Asian Program Manager of Climate Bonds Initiative, who shares the ability of green bonds and some examples in global markets. Please welcome. Thank you very much. Good afternoon, everyone. It's a pleasure to be uh, here today. Climate Bonds Initiative is a not-for-profit organization based in the UK. It is at the service of investors and other financial institutions and issuers to promote the green bond market as a way to respond to the big challenge we are facing today, i.e. climate change. Green bonds have emerged as a very powerful instrument to align financial flows towards that goal. At the end of 2020, we reached 1 trillion US dollars of green bonds outstanding. And it is, is a, it is expected that by 2023, we will be reaching $2 trillion of green social and sustainability bonds. So what has been achieved in the first six years of this market will be achieved in the next two years. And we see a very strong rate of growth coming from all regions of the world. When we look at Asia Pacific, it represents a, quite a big share of this market, about 23% of global issuance in 2020. And it's dominated mostly by China, but ASEAN as a region is also quite active. You can see here the breakdown by country. Singapore leads the way with a lot of issuance of green loans and green bonds to finance renewable energy or green buildings. In Thailand, we have seen some very successful issuance as well for the renewable energy space and transportation as a low carbon solution for uh, our cities. When we look at the types of issuers that are using these instruments to raise capital, it is comforting to see that not only the sovereigns are coming to market with these thematic instruments, but also the non-financial corporates as companies find these instruments a convenient way not only to raise cheap capital, but also uh, promote their credentials when it comes to green, social and sustainable goals. In terms of the types of instruments that, as a corporate, you are able to use to raise capital, there are several. The most traditional way are loans. So we see term loans and other forms of loans representing about 40% of this market. Also bonds in senior secured or senior unsecured form, but also as perpetual bonds have been issued in ASEAN by, for example, in the Philippines, AC Energy and also in the forms of Islamic instrument. Green Sukuk have emerged as an interesting in, uh, share of this market with Malaysia and Indonesia seeing quite a bit of issuance there. In terms of the tenors, it is also interesting to see that the green bonds that we see issued are sometimes often very long dated. Uh, five to 10 year maturity instrument represent 36% of this market and 10 to 20 year maturity instruments, 38%, meaning that it is able, possible to finance long dated projects, uh, for example, in the renewable energy space or in the real estate. And indeed, those two sectors represent the core of the issuance that we see in ASEAN. However, we are quite hopeful that in the region, there will be more issuance going forward for other sectors like waste management, water treatment, land uses, as well as uh, telecoms and other forms of uh, industrial applications. As we move to transition bonds, as it was explained before, we are also trying to see how to develop the market for other forms of uh, transition bonds for hard to abate sectors like chemicals, uh, steel, or other uh, sectors that are uh, contributing to uh, the pollution in our cities. It has been explained already uh, how what is the process of issuing a green bond, i.e. preparing a green bond framework, hiring a verifier to review this green bond framework, and reporting annually on the use of proceeds. But I would like to zoom in on the uh, option that issuers have to get a certification from us. We have developed the climate bond standard which has been uh, discussed with investors and scientists to
to choose what types of projects are indeed aligned with the Paris Agreement. It is not always easy to find the right projects that will have uh, the correct level of contribution and uh, those that are not polluting. So through this certification scheme, we are able to increase the quality of the selection process for issuers. This certification is based on the work that the verifier will be conducting. Uh, all the criteria are publicly disclosed on our website. They are quite precise in terms of the thresholds that uh, we want to see in, in the projects that are selected. The reporting process after the issuance is also quite stringent and it ensures that investors are comfortable that only the best projects are chosen. This is a table that shows for which sectors we already have criteria, i.e. the blue dots that you see on this chart. And as you can see, there is quite a few already. Uh, the energy sector is well covered from solar, wind, geothermal, bioenergy, hydropower and marine renewables. The transport sector with private transport, public passenger transport, trail rail and waterborne. The water sector with water monitoring, storage, treatment, distribution, flood defense and nature-based solutions, as well as buildings and waste management. So again, you can refer to our website, climatebonds.net. There is a section there where all this information is publicly disclosed. So if you are looking at uh, any industry in particular, you may want to see what are the criteria and how they have been laid out. It is possible to combine different sectors within one issuance. For example, if a project includes some renewable energy component as well as uh, green buildings or other water management systems and so on. And through that exercise, it's possible to access new forms of capital. There is a lot of investors looking to deploy uh, their investments to these uh, new projects and this is proving to be a very popular form of investment among them. Thank you very much and I will be very happy to answer any questions you may have on this topic. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Raymond, for sharing us. Well, once, once again, again, don't be missed miss our polling, polling questions. questions. You will have you the will opportunity, have the opportunity to, to participate, participate with the panel this panel discussion this by choose your most interesting topic by clicking the below polling link as below image. And also, if you have any questions, please feel free to send it to the Q&A channel. Next, the speaker who will share us the target benefit and deal of transaction in sustainability link Learn and Bonds. Please welcome Mr. Yong Yu Set Tawiwat, Managing Director, Group Treasurer of Thai Union Frozen Product, Public Company Limited. Please welcome Mr. Yong Yu. Good afternoon, uh, everyone. So I'm very pleased to be here as the panelist for the journal Toward Blue Financing at Thai Union. Um, blue financing is the subcategory of green financing, so that I will go through detail. And blue financing just want to focus the benefit of sustainability activity to the healthy of the ocean. Before we move into um, financing, I want to give a brief background on Thai Union and also the sustainability at Thai Union. So Thai Union is the global seafood leader. We are the owner of the sea lead in Thailand, John West or Pitin Weir in Europe, or Chicken of the Sea in US. We put the focus on the sustainability and also innovation back maybe uh, six years ago, 2015, uh, that we want to focus on sustainability and innovation and use these two as the competitive edge uh, to compete with other competitors in the global level. So if you look at the bottom, 90% of our revenue come from overseas uh, country. And you can see that we have a production facility in 14 countries around the world. We have 45,000 employees globally and 7.8,000 is 
was uh, employee outside Thailand. And we have the global leadership team of 12 members. Nine of them is uh, non-Thai management, but one of them, uh, the accessibility head. So that's why you can see we put the accessibility as the core of our business. On accessibility at Thai Union, if you recall back uh, 2015 until 2017, by that time, Thailand was hit hard by, you know, European or US when European give the yellow card uh, as the warning on the IUU. IUU is illegal, unreported, unregulated fishing, right? And also US give the warning on the human trafficking on the TIP report. So as the global seafood leader, we, we have the responsibility uh, to set the standard for our uh, industry. And at the same time, Thailand take that opportunity to overhaul its entire fishing industry just to comply with international standard. So by that time, 2015, we initiate the sea change program, changing seafood for, for good, right? So overarching objective is we focus on sustainable sea, and also safe and legal labor and combat on the climate change. So our program focus on four pillars. The first one is safe and legal labor, so that we focus not only at Thai Union, but also for the full supply chain, including the supplier and also uh, linked to the customer. Responsibly sourcing the second pillar, we focus on the transparent and accessibility of our sourcing. And the third pillar, responsible operation, that more at the factory and also cover the safety environment at the factory level of our people and also community. The last pillar is on the people and community when we want to improve the living of uh, people around the world. And the way we, we man, uh, do this sustainability is we put three principles, right? We put the good governance, we put transparency, and we do the partnership and collaboration with all other third parties just to improve. So that all what we have done is align with UNSDG 8, 14, 13, and 2. So over last year, we got many many reward and recognition right we are the member of djsi for seven consecutive year and last year we was ranked number two in our food product uh, index but we was ranked number one for the two year earlier uh, from last year right we also include in the thailand sustainability investment index by the stock exchange of thailand we also the member of uh, FT focus and also we got a lot of reward that you can see from this page right and going forward looking forward to the future 2025 we put the healthy living healthy ocean so that we we put uh, focus on our product uh, our core product that we can you know uh, produce the nutrition nutrition or supplement from our byproduct, and we also improve the process and look into the safety, health, and environment at the same time. And also on the ocean, we put the focus on, as I mentioned, sustainability of the sourcing. So that on the Thai Union and sustainability that we have. So coming back to the finance section, right? So our belief on sustainable financing uh, could corporate citizens should be able to better access to larger pool of liquidity at lower cost of financing. That, that our belief. So, so from that belief, you can see that we, we set the target uh, to have the sustainable finance target. Uh, in 2020, last year, 100% of our financing is traditional finance. So just this year, going to next year, we set the target to have 50% of our long-term financing. How of that, you know, 1.4 billion, half of 1.4 billion, we set the target to be the sustainable finance. 
And we set also set the target by 2025, we will increase this to 75%. So what we expect on the cost of debt from those instruments, you can see on the right hand side is five up to 10 basis points that we can uh, benefit from, from those uh, products. So that, that come from the initial discount from the accessibility aspect and also step down or step up of the uh, interest mechanism. So we set the target and, and below is our journey, right? So in January, Feb, we issue 12 billion accessibility link loan in Thailand and in Japan. And just last two months in July, we issue the first accessibility link bond in Thailand for 5 uh, billion baht, right? And in next two to three months, we are considering to issue the second SLL or SLB in the amount of 6 billion baht, right? So now, uh, you know, uh, I want to discuss on the how we link accessibility strategy to finance activity. You have heard from Sadiq. Uh, on those uh, use of proceeds type of uh, financing, how the framework uh, have been set, right? So on the subsidy thing is a little bit different from, from that one because, you know, we need to set the KPI. The KPI we need to use to measure our success on the subsidy, right? And then we need to set the target of such KPI, what the target that we want to achieve going forward during the life of the loan or the bond, right? So the KPI need to be robustness. Robustness is mean that it need to relevant, important and material to your business or your strategy, uh, uh, sustainability strategies. And the target need to be ambitious. Ambitious is mean that, you know, is, is improving target, not uh, and challenging target. So that these two, uh, we need to put in the, into the framework and you need to put number three financial characteristic. It means that if we achieve those target, what we will, we will get from the interest adjustment, whether we will receive the step down of the interest or if we fail, whether we need to pay more interest, that one will be under the financial characteristic. Right, and then reporting how we will report those KPI and those SPT. Uh, for us, we, we will uh, report annually, and those report right. We will have the verifier. So I will talk on the, those three KPI on and also the verifier. So that we put those number one until number five into our facility financing framework, and those framework follow the principle that we have from if the bond is come from the IGMA, International Capital Market Association, the principle 2020, right? If is we refer to the loan is we will uh, follow those SLLP 2021, just uh, release easily from uh, LMA. So that this framework will be reviewed and endorsed by the second party provider so that in our case for SLB, we have the sustain, uh, sustainability to endorse our KPI and our target, and also our framework that we, we uh, produce, right? Then we move to what the KPI or the target that we set in this, in, in our financing for SLL or SLB, right? So that we put three target, you can see from here, uh, the KPI one is on the DJSI. You can see that we already achieved seven year uh, consec consecutively and rank number one and number two, right? Our target for, for the next uh, will be included into DJSI every year and also rank top 10 in DJSI food industry in there, right? That's the KPI number one. KPI number two is on the carbon intensity. So this one is direct to the climate change. We have already achieved from 2016 until last year, 2020, 28% reduction of carbon intensity. So we set the target to reduce further 4% annually under scope one and the scope two carbon intensity. 
And the last KPI that we put in sustainability link bond or loan is on the tuna vessel with electronic monitoring or human observer on board, right? So this this one is clearly new initiative to improve the tuna sourcing, uh, sustainability, and and also traceability. So in 2020, we have 75 percent of tuna with, uh, that we buy from the vessel that have electronic monitoring or have the human observer on board right we set this target to increase by five percent every year so that you know uh, by 2025 all our tuna that we purchase it need to come from the tuna vessel with electronic monitoring and human observer so this one we will gain a lot of uh, information from from electronic monitoring in terms of traceability transparency iuu and also by cash and also uh, living uh, in under the ocean right so that that the uh, what we set on our sustainability link finance that we have so you put here on the key benefit that we we have from the financing we have so you can see that we direct uh, they have direct link between cost of debt and sustainability strategy right and then we can use this to demonstrate our commitment to stakeholder so this uh, more on we can have the publicity on what we have done right and also we can access to the larger pool of liquidity and for sure that when we have the larger pool it means that we have uh, bargaining power to to uh, negotiate the interest right and with this sustainability link the proceed can be used for general corporate purpose it means that we have the flexibility in terms of uh, financing uh, and also we have deep and uh, deeper good relationship and interact with the bank especially the one that put the ESG in focus right and we also have the internal alignment across organization so now it means that not only sustainability people will talk will talk about the sustainability right we also finance people will talk about this sustainability and 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 we will you know check the progress what we have done so this pathway to the growth finance so just the last page you know uh we see the growing importance of sustainability to finance world just you know yesterday we uh on tuesday we had the announcement from monetary authority of singapore to appoint uh dr darren mcbain she she is the ex head of sustainability development at thai union now you know mas said uh appoint her as the chief sustainability officer just taking care for to develop green financing at Singapore. So just just to give you an example how important of sustainability into finance world. Yeah, that complete my presentation. Welcome to take the question later. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Yong Yusit Tawiwat for sharing us. Well, turning to today's panel discussion. Once again, please join me welcoming our distinguished panelists. Mr. Cedric Rimold, Mr. Yungyu Setha Wiwat, and Mr. Aris Stimulus, Managing Director, Corporate Finance of AW Alloyd Australia. And not be missed, the moderator of this session, Ms. Shruti Katari, Head of Communications of AW Alloyd. We are now closing the poll, and let me hand it over Ms. Shruti to share the results with everyone. Thank you so much, Kunna Nisha. As the results come in, I figure we might as well dive straight into the questions. We've got a great itinerary for today. So on to the first one. What are the key challenges for the overall market? Is it lack of standardization as to what can be considered green, lack of non-financial data or systems for reporting and disclosure, or perhaps capacity constraints within third parties for verification of performance? Cedric, I'll start with you. Thank you very much. Uh, yeah, these are good questions. Yeah. Uh, on, on the questions of standardization, I think uh, this is okay. The market has already quite uh, evolved uh, since the early days. 
Um, and, and now there are standards in place, uh, the green bond principles for one, uh, from the ICMA, um, and the, uh, the European Union is working on a green taxonomy. In China, there, there has been the green bond catalog. Uh, there are guidelines uh, that are being drafted uh, for the ASEAN region as well. Uh, each, uh, each market has its own regulator, and I know the SEC in Thailand has been very proactive in coming out with, with some guidelines. And I think from next year, about 700 uh, listed companies in, on the Bangkok uh, Stock Exchange will be reporting on ESG. So there, there is a lot of standards that already exist. And uh, even if you are in a specific industry, uh, I believe that there will be standards that have been developed for your particular industry. For example, in the, in the food and beverage or, or the agricultural space, I think there is, there is already a lot of uh, information that exists. So it's not so much... Uh, uh, that uh, I think uh, I mean there is there are always some critics out there that claim that there, you know there are not enough standards, but I think we we've gone a long way already. So I don't think that that's uh, really a problem. Uh, on the, the the extra efforts that is required by an issuer to come to market, I also believe it's not such a great deal. Uh, yes, you need to develop a green bond framework. Uh, it's a it's a little bit of work and you need a, a verifier to review but the, the benefits are there uh, and kun young will will attest that there, that there are some pricing, pricing benefits if, if you, you can, can lower your cost, cost of financing by by, by a few basis points, points it will amply cover the extra cost of of doing this work so i i don't think that that is a big deal uh, for companies that are looking to optimize their their cost of financing Thank you, Cedric. Kun Yong, you, do you indeed agree with Cedric? Yeah, I, I do agree with him on, on those standardization, right? And all those uh, issues, I mean, standardize or what to consider green, all of those uh, technical issues that, that we can set the principle or the guideline to make this green finance acceptable for to all parties involved, right? However, we may need to take the balance between cost and benefit, right? To stringent requirement will be add additional cost to the product and could maybe easily kill the deal, right? If the financial and non-financial benefit are not outweigh the cost. And I think the most challenging for, for green finance is on the e economic benefit to drive this green financing, right? If the market can, I believe that if the market can differentiate clearly on the rating of the company on the sustainability fronts and give different pricing to reflect such rating in addition to credit rating, this will help encourage and incentivize the issue to move toward uh, sustainability and green financing. And also, you know, investing in green finance should also bring benefit to the investor as well. And this green finance should be perceived as a little bit lower risk portfolio to the investor, since sustainability could be the competitive edge or even be the tool to sustain the company or the business in the future. That that my thinking. Thank you, Kun Yong Yu. Aris, would you like to add to that in terms of key challenges of the overall market? Yeah, I think, uh, again, it's uh, it's the rate of adoption, right? So you've got uh, the standards there, which, uh, as Cedric was saying, uh, are pretty much well developed. Um, but I, I think for some for some issues, it's still going to be a, a new process. Uh, so, uh, you know, getting up to speed uh, quickly uh, and then getting used to those uh, standards uh, so they, the, the companies can obviously develop frames internally. Uh, in terms of the ongoing compliance, I think that's that's important. But again, the the economics are important, right? The you can't have a situation where uh, you know for me, meeting certain milestones, uh, you're going to get a lower cost of financing, uh, but but those savings are, are outweighed by the cost of compliance. Uh, so I think uh, that's an interesting sort of field for for service providers uh, to to get engaged in to to make the process as uh, as smooth. Uh, as, as possible and reduce the costs, right? So everybody benefits at, at the end of the day. Um, you know, the one, the one thing that I would also say in terms of, you know, challenges going forward, again, let's, let's face it, you know, interest rates are probably at the lowest that they've been forever. Uh, it's probably a great time for issuers to sort of get involved uh, out there. Uh, yes, there, there, there are cost savings uh, and it's great to sort of uh, get your, 
your company's name attached to a specific uh, green or, or, or social project. Uh, but I do believe that right now, um, you know, interest rates are quite low. So issues should definitely sort of uh, take that into account and, uh, and uh, you know, get, get some bonds issued. If I can also add uh, to that, uh, I think there are some wider benefits that corporates should consider. We are in a period where we absolutely need to change uh, our, the way we manufacture products and we consume. And this will bring benefits to businesses. For example, take the case of energy. We have been used to paying a lot of money to produce energy. Now, renewable energy is making the cost of electricity, for example, extremely cheap when it's based on solar or wind or uh, other forms of renewable energy. The same for buildings. Saving energy and better using water in buildings is also a, a, an opportunity to save costs. And, and I'm sure, you know, for Thai Union as well, the changes that are being implemented will bring some maybe better profitability over time because the business is going to consider how to make better use of energy consumption, uh, how to reduce maybe some uh, costs along the way, uh, transform the supply chain, work with uh, suppliers and customers as well on, on how to, to make the products more appealing to consumer, to, to derive some uh, you know, pricing advantage in the market as well. So I think if you are uh, the leader of a corporation today, uh, you can start reviewing your whole business. And we see some green bond issuers that actually do that. I, I remember very early on, we were always citing the example of a, of a Japanese um, uh, paper company, uh, which issued a green bond to invest in the way they were using water, uh, sourcing the paper, managing their waste, and, and they were transforming their, their manufacturing process uh, you know, to, to, to improve uh, the profitability of their business. And, and that's how, as a business leader, uh, you should really look at it. It's, uh, it, is, it requires a little bit of effort, but it will bring benefits. Uh, I, I firmly believe so. Thank, thank you to all three of you. Excellent answers. Um, I would like to dive a little further. I know we've touched on this into the key benefits and challenges for corporate issuers of green bonds. Um, perhaps, Kun Young, since you seem to have gone into this a little further, um, we'll start with you. Yes, sure. Yeah. So I, I did mention about the benefit from the, the bond or the loan that we issue, right? So those are positive publicity or diversification of investor or lower cost of uh, financing. All of those benefits we, we can earn from issuing this green finance, right? So I will focus more on the challenge that, that I think, you know, and also as the issuer, right? So I, I will compare between traditional finance and also the, with the green finance, right? So the first one is, I think, to put the real commitment and the focus into the sustainability issue is the key challenge. So, you know, now I think it's unavoidable in the future since all participants will need to move into this direction to set the sustainability objective that's suitable to the business and embed it into a such objective into the operation, right? Uh, it's not uh, only but the benefit from sustainability as uh, Cedric mentioned, and also we can leverage into financing, into the you know commercial, and this one as I mentioned could be the competitive edge comparing to our competitor that do not do anything on on this uh, front, right? So and also tone from the top is very important. To, to have this uh, kind of uh, direction. And also we need to be patient at early stage since it will not uh, fully or even partially give the return back to you in short period of time, right? So that, that's the first thing on the real commitment from the issue, right? The second thing is more on, you know, back to the cost and benefit, right? So we did mention about the premium or premium from the green. So if it's not well established to partially up, uh, compensate such effort that we need to put on uh, or the cost that we need to put on to, to do the green financing, 
uh, finance instead of do the traditional finance. Or in the other hand, if the green financing is not comparatively cheaper than comparing to those for traditional financing, right? Why else, you know, the company need to pay, uh, spend the money for ESG already, right? So that it's not encouraging for all to move into those direction to promote this green finance. So it's back to my point, if we can uh, have a different between issuer, between paper, and then give a special treatment or the pricing to the different, those different uh, DA, right? So that I think the market can can uh, develop from, from, from that point and can encourage uh, many more issuer to come into this green financing space. If I can uh, also say uh, one of the challenges that I think any corporation should really consider before going into this market is also how it will portray itself in front of investors, in front of shareholders, in front of employees, in front of clients, in front of suppliers. You know, this is also showing commitment to the sustainability transformation. And uh, there are some risks, as uh, it was uh, mentioned in the first presentation, that, uh, you know, there are some mishaps in the market. Uh, there are few, uh, but they are there as well. So you have to be a little bit careful not to make false promises. Uh, and and what, one one thing that I, I noted from uh, Punyong Yu's presentation is is the use of carbon intensity. Uh, I, I totally understand that you know the KPI is there and and it's uh, it's something that can be measured. However, what really matters is the absolute level of carbon emissions. It is. I mean, carbon intensity is part of that, for sure. Uh, but as well, we have to consider the overall carbon footprint of a business. This is very important. This needs to be measured correctly by professional people who know how to measure those things. Uh, we, we, th th that's really what matters today with, with the changes that we see happening with climate change. You know, it is the level of carbon that is in our atmosphere that is changing radically the way our nature system are, are operating. And this is a big risk. And this is a big risk for Thailand in particular, uh, which is a country that is extremely you know, sensitive to those changes. Uh, you could have extreme heat events, for example, that cause drought in, in the north of Thailand and, and reduce the production of, of agricultural products. You can have the sea level rise that affects you know, uh, the, the coastline. Uh, and many other un unusual weather events that can cause dramatic impacts uh, on the country. Uh, this is very critical that we tackle this problem of carbon emissions head on. And this is the absolute level of carbon emissions ultimately that, that are part that we need to reduce. This is very important and this is going to accentuate going forward as the world is becoming more aware of the impact of climate change. Uh, and I don't know what it is in Thailand, but I can tell you in the international news, we always hear about those extreme events, you know, that are happening around the world, be it from the bushfires in, in Australia or the, the hurricanes in the US and so on. Uh, and, and people realize that our nature is now uh, at risk and our, you know, all, all our natural systems are, are being dis in a state of, of transformation, and, and that can be quite dangerous. Thank you, Cedric. Harris, would you like to add to the challenges or benefits? Yeah, I, I think um, uh, I'm going to be a little bit more optimistic here. Uh, we, we have a situation where uh, there, there's, there's clearly an abundance of capital. Uh, you know, we, we're living times where capital is actually not scarce, right? So uh, clearly, as, as Cedric was saying earlier on, to the extent uh, smart businesses can go out there, uh, rethink the way that they, they do things to be more efficient than in the long, say, in the medium to long to long term, uh, realize some uh, solid uh, uh, cost savings, uh, you know, across the board, whether it's, it's energy um, you know, generation, energy utilization, um, whether it's the, the cost of their labor force, et cetera, et cetera. This is a fantastic time to actually go out there and tap into a, let's just call it a new pool of capital that is now, that is now sensitive to, to achieving those goals, right? 
uh, and it's it's at, at interest rates that that, that are, are so so low. So you know why why wouldn't you be out there sort of you know looking to uh, you know to tweak or maybe perhaps overhaul some of your business processes, right? And and I think here's the here's the advantage that I certainly see for for Asia. Uh, you know if you if you look at Europe, if you look at uh, North America. Part of the biggest uh, problems that I, I see that those countries uh, face is that they, they've got to take out legacy systems, right? And, and there's a, an additional cost to that. A lot of times in Asia, you're, you're putting down new infrastructure that isn't there. You're just, you know, as, as these economies are growing so rapidly, you are actually just putting down new, new infrastructure. So you do have this ability to leapfrog a lot of the legacy uh, technologies, you know, whether, whether they be in energy or, you know, logistics systems, et cetera, et cetera. So now you have this opportunity to put in place, you know, brand new processes, technologically advanced processes with cheap capital and additionally get sort of benefits from that capital because you have investors that are, let's just say, willing to subsidize for that, right? So I, again, I think it's a, it's a, it's a very optimistic time for, for a lot of uh, corporates to sort of you know, actually look at their business plan, look at their long-term strategies and, and, and go out there and, and work with investors, work with, uh, you know, um, Cedric and, and his team uh, to, to put a lot of these bonds in place, whether they be transition bonds or green bonds. Thank you, Aris. Kun Young, do, do you agree with that optimistic bent? Yes, yes, and maybe I just want to go back to the point that Cedric just just mentioned right on the carbon uh, <laughs> intensity or uh, absolute, right? So as the manufacturing is not not easy to commit on those absolute, right? We spend you know two weeks to discuss with the second party opinion provider what the plan you know and what the the uh, strategy that we will implement over next uh, period under our commitment of over the life of the loan or the broad right we we set target clearly internally you know but uh, as i said as the manufacturing we we think that commit on those uh, intensity should be better for, for us but in fact, you know, our business in terms of production, the cost is very small. It means that we commit on those intensity. It's also commit on absolute number as well. Yeah. And, and it's, it's very challenging period to, to talk with the second party opinion. Recently, you, I mean, they try to, you know, keep the standard as the second party opinion provider, right? So that's good for the industry thing. Otherwise, you know, everyone can easily issue this paper with, you know, not very ambitious uh, KPI or target is, is will da damage the, the development of the market. What That's what I think, yeah. Thank you, Ping Yong Yu. Um, Aris, you talked a little bit about this region and why it's a good time uh, to get into green finance. I would like to zoom in a little further to Thailand. Do you perceive any limitations in the issuance of green and sustainable financing instruments in Thailand? And if so, how can they best be addressed? Maybe regulatory drivers, data availability, or verification bodies? Perhaps, Aris, I'll start with you here. Yeah, um, I, I think, again, obviously, uh, let's just say regulators can always provide uh, the right incentive structures. Uh, perhaps it is uh, applying like a like a stamp on top of a, a, a certifier, for example. So you know, in the same way, let, let's just use uh, the rating agencies as as an analogy, right? Um, each country says, okay, these are the rating agencies that that we think you know do a decent job in terms of rating bonds as far as they're you know, co corporate uh, risk is concerned, right? Uh, you know, you could, you could have anybody establishing their own rating agencies, but they, they are not, uh, uh, you know, they, they, they are not accredited by, by the regulators, right? Um, so, so that would be one thing. Um, the other thing, of course, is, uh, again, providing incentives, right? So not, not only on the regulated side, but for argument's sake, tax, tax incentives. Uh, so again, it's, it's, it's this idea of, 
you, you know, defining the, the overall uh, policy objectives uh, in each one of these countries. And, and what do the regulators do about it? What, what do the tax authorities do about it? So to the extent that they can um, pr provide a market where, again, investors are incentivized, issuers are incentivized, uh, keeping the market open so that you have, uh, let's just call it a, as free a flow of capital as possible to, to come to these, uh, to these opportunities. Uh, so, you know, you want to keep the doors open for international capital to come in. I think all of those things w are, are, are positive, right? Uh, so, yeah, that, that would be in a nutshell my, my response to that. Thank you, Aris. How about Taiyunian? Have you experienced any limitations in Thailand? Um, in fact, you know, we are the first one to issue the sustainability link bond so that going along the process, we, we have many, many challenges, you know, at every step, right? So starting from uh, setting the framework, we never set, uh, we, we have the sustainability strategy, right? But never set those strategy linked back to financing, right? So that, that the first thing that we do, and from those, we need to pick up the KPI, we need to set the target, right? And those KPI and target, we need to discuss with the second party opinion provider that the second challenge, right? And then, you know, uh, we have the framework that endorsed by second party opinion, right? And then how we go with this framework to find the investor, the right investor that put the ESG in focus, right? So we, we need to spend time and to look at those investors and then try to present, you know, uh, and also uh, gain them interest on our paper, right? So luckily we, we know that some institution, they have very good policy in place so that we, we know exactly that they will interest in our paper, right? And then, we also have the challenge, just for example, uh, in terms of the mark to market to put those paper as the investment port or, you know, long uh, trading port, something like that, that we need to uh, uh, encounter those problems or to find a solution. And also, uh, we also have some question picking up, like uh, whether this, uh, this paper is the derivative paper or just bond sustainability link loan or bond just the simple as that right so that that's many challenge that we we need to overcome and at the end because of the good intention of ourselves i mean uh, want to be the first one to set the good standard to the market and also with the support from the sec or thai bma or even the bank of thailand so that we, we can all come and, you know, have very successful launch of the first S SMB. Yeah. Thank you, Kun Yang. Cedric, I would love to hear your thoughts. Well, I think Thailand is very well positioned. Uh, it has a very active domestic bond market uh, where, you know, companies in Thailand are, are issue, uh, know what it is to, to issue a bond. So that's a good starting point. You know, there are countries that don't have this benefit of knowing uh, how, how to, to manage bonds. Uh, you have a very supportive uh, Securities and Exchange Commission. Uh, we, we are uh, you know, engaged with the SEC in Thailand uh, at many levels. Uh, we, we have uh, you know, speakers who speak in our conference and, and uh, we have been engaged uh, quite a lot. Uh, there is the ongoing process of developing the ASEAN taxonomy where the Thai SEC is quite involved as well to represent Thailand's interests, which is a good thing. That means that it will be better adopted for Thailand. Uh, there is also uh, the benefit of having a country rating, which is good. That means that international investors will look favorably to Thailand and Thai issuers. Uh, you have uh, also uh, banks that are able also to act as a relay uh, by issuing green bonds internationally and then on land to uh, small and medium-sized enterprises in Thailand. So that's also a good thing to bring capital into the country. Uh, you have also a, a, an economic uh, industry that is quite diverse. So there is the potential for issuing various types of green bonds. 
Uh, we've seen renewable energy, like the big green issuance. We've seen low carbon transport, like the BTS group issuance. We've seen, uh, you know, agri-forestry, like, uh, you know, uh, Thai Union, but also uh, PTT with the reforestation proje projects uh, in, in Thailand, uh, a royal project, which uh, is showing, uh, you know, good leadership as well. Uh, so there are multiple uh, areas where Thai companies and Thai uh, also uh, government entities could come to market by issuing green bonds, and uh, and this is a yeah in general uh, Thailand is is ready for you know an acceleration of the growth that we are seeing in this market, and uh, if there is any help that is needed, please uh, reach out to us as well. We are interested in helping Thailand. To, to, to increase the issuance. We have been involved, for example, with trees rating for them to become approved verifier to deliver our certification. So if you are interested, you can contact them as well. They, they know about the certification uh, and they can help uh, Thai issuers to gain that certification that would uh, add to the credentials of the business when going in front of investors. So uh, yeah, overall, uh, it, it's quite positive. Let's uh, bring it on. New deals, more deals, please. <laughs> Thank you. Wow, that's got me feeling very upbeat. <laughs> Another upbeat question. We have witnessed exponential growth around 15 times in the issuance of social bonds, presumably driven by the implications of COVID-19. What type of instrument do you see growing in the next three years? Climate resilience bonds, blue bonds, transition bonds, sustainability performance linked loans, other, and why? Let's start with Kunyong Yu. Um, I think, as you mentioned, right, the COVID impact that, that uh, hit hardly, so that I would expect that the potential issuer that may tap the sizable issue from the domestic bond market will be the government sector, right, to fund those. Uh, with relief and also to ensure economic stability with infrastructure investment. So the mix of social and sustainability bond would be the area that I think it can grow in next coming year. The sustainable purpose or the use of proceed type of green financing, I think still dominate the market since it's still easier to follow the principle in many industries, right? So like you have the project, uh, big project, and, and it's considered as green or social, you just can put that into those green financing, right? But for sustainability uh, performance link, financing type, this the, the, the discussion on the robustness or the ambitiousness uh, require good supporting data. So I think it might be a key challenge for the company who would like to explore this route, but it's, it's not, not, you know, uh, the limitation, but it will need more effort and, and you know, uh, convincing to those uh, sustainability uh, second party opinion provider to, to give you the good report to back up your paper. Yeah, that's what I think. Thank you, Kenny you. What about Cedric? What type of instrument would you bet on? Well, green bonds are definitely there to stay, uh, and we see an acceleration of the issuance. So I, I would put my bet on that as, a, as the main driver of this market. However, what we see in Southeast Asia and Thailand also is the interest in sustainability transactions. Why? Because the social aspect is very important. You, you have populations that are also developing at, socially, and you need to ensure that the growth is inclusive. And it's especially true in this COVID time where we need to build back better, not only uh, the, the structural side of our society, but also the social uh, side. And, that, and we've seen some very innovative deals like Bank of Ayudhya that uh, issued a gender bond, for example, focusing on, on women-led businesses. And, uh, and, and there's some, some great innovation that can happen as well uh, to focus on, on, on minorities or, or maybe some, some sectors uh, of, the, of the economy that are uh, benefiting less from this growth. Uh, this is very important uh, to ensure the stability uh, of the region. And, uh, you know, there, there are always risks that, uh, the, you know, uh, social aspect can also 
cause trouble for our society. So let, let's not forget that. You know, we, we are fighting the climate change, but that's for the, the benefit of the people as well. Thank you, Cedric. That was very insightful. Aris, what about you? What, uh, what instrument would you lay money on? Um, yeah, I think I think these instruments are going to continue to evolve, uh, and we're going to be surprised at, at some of the new uh, permutations of these. I, I, I see this as a, uh, I think there are two things that are happening. Uh, number one, you know, we've got a lot more data out there, right? We, we can gather data uh, so we can measure the impact uh, significantly more than what we could, you know, arguably even, even 10 years ago, right? Um, I, think I think it's, it's also, also the maturation, maturation of this market. market. So, uh, what, what has probably happened is, you know, if, if there's just going to be a green, I think what happened initially, there was just a green agenda, but then people realized, hold on, it's a little bit more nuanced, right? The applying just, just a blanket green agenda in this part of the world is going to be significantly tough if all of a sudden a whole, pe a whole bunch of people are displaced from, from their work, right? So, to me, this is, this is another sort of, a nuanced way of making sure that those those people that are being displaced by you know what would have been a traditional way of you know being a coal miner for argument's sake uh you know there, there, there is another there's another way for those people to maybe upskill right so you're providing for educational facilities etc through through these types of uh, social bonds um so yeah i i definitely see that that market increasing and it'll increase sort of side to side with uh you know, with uh, the the green uh, the green markets again. Uh, you know, as Cedric was saying, you it, it's not you can't see one of these things in isolation. You know, you're you're talking about all of these ha things happening together. So to the extent that we can get out there, be smart in terms of how we allocate uh, these uh, you know capital resources. Um, yeah, that's uh, again, it's a positive thing. If I can add also one area that I think will capture a lot of growth is in the transition space. The transition bonds are not yet well defined. Uh, I think there have been mentioned of, of elements of them, uh, like the sustainability linked bond securities that allow for some elements of transition. But it's still being formulated. Uh, Climate Bonds Initiative published a white paper in September last year with Credit Suisse trying to sketch a little bit what should be the core principle of what transition bonds should be. And uh, we have our conference going on this week and tomorrow there will be a day you know, reserved for transitions. This is the next chapter that we are opening up. What, what is meant by transition? What we mean is that we are not going to win the fight against climate change if we are not addressing the hard to abate sectors, which are fossil fuels, uh, hard manufacturing like steel, cement, chemicals, and so on. These are difficult sectors to change. Yet, there will be solutions. I think recently we've seen the first shipment of green steel, uh, which means that it's, carbon, it's not emitting carbon emissions. So there are going to be innovations. But what is key? is the data and the science that go behind you know measuring those impacts so anything that can be done you know in thailand included to increase the knowledge and the science and working with your universities on on how to develop those pathways towards you know zero carbon manufacturing it's very important to focus because that's the future and that's how you will create high value jobs you know for the future to, to, and, and sometimes uh, workers will need to be retrained and, and you know, we, we have to learn throughout our life. It, it's not just uh, at university, it's also on the job. And, and yeah, for some sectors it's going to be more difficult, but I'm, I'm sure even for Thai Union, for example, training people is an integral part of, of learning to do better business. And I think all businesses need to do that more and more, but this is, this is a, good, a good thing as well. Thank you. Thank you, Cedric. Um, I would like to delve a little further actually into um, the evolution and innovation of these instruments. So we are beginning to see more convergence between climate change and biodiversity as key issues that companies must address often simultaneously. How can this be best addressed through green finance instruments? Through existing classes of green instruments or is a new instrument required? 
So, uh, if I can start, uh, there are new instruments that are appearing, or, or reappearing, I should say, which are carbon credits. Uh, carbon credits did uh, had a false start a few years ago, and then the market died down. But now it's trying to be relaunched, and, and COP26, which is around the corner, uh, in two months' time, we will give some uh, clear indication of how this market is going to evolve. Uh, China has started its own uh, carbon trading scheme, and uh, Singapore is launching uh, an exchange as well with uh, you know some leading banks and the stock exchange on how to trade carbon. Uh, why, why am I referring to carbon credits? Is because this is a key instrument to protect biodiversity. Why? Because if you want to give value to a forest and you want to give value to leaving the forest as it is, i.e. not cutting the trees, one way to do that is to assign a value through carbon credits. So maintaining you know, uh, virgin forests in many parts of Southeast Asia will be given a value through carbon credits to offset uh, the pollution done by others. And, uh, and this, is a, this is a new instrument that is going to uh, gain popularity, I think, uh, as as uh, it will become more of a commodity that uh, not not only uh, companies but also investors can start trading, and, and this will have the benefit of uh, giving value to those uh, very very valuable ecosystems that we have, which are the forests and all the animals that live within the forest. And, and let's not forget, you know, the, the pandemic that we are uh, living through. Uh, some of its uh, remedies and the vaccines that we need for to fight those pandemics uh, are to be found in those forests as well, where there are uh, you know chemical compounds or, 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 or yeah uh, that are necessary to derive the vaccine. So we must protect those, and, and that's very important. Uh, and, and Southeast Asia is very rich in, in those ecosystems, so it, it needs to be protected. Thank you, Cedric. Kuniyongi, what is your position on this? Wow, you gave a good thought, said it. <laughs> uh, on, for, for, for us, I think uh, the climate change or biodiversity issue is not, not a problem that we can solve by one, right? So it's issue that requiring effort for many particip participants. Uh, if I'm talking about the seafood business that we are doing, right, the whole supply chain is very complicated and involve many participants who need to play their role as well, starting from fishery, supplier, lake greater, international, international ocean organization, factory, ship liner, you know, yes, as a name, right? That already so many people involved in, in the process. So that that's why we create the sea chain program, you know, uh, to put those uh, and we use as the backbone of our sustainability strategy, right? To fully dress uh, our seafood from cash to consumption. And with this full, uh, full traceability in place, uh, we think that, you know, we will be able to identify, investigate, and improve performance of the key issue, such as labor or less responsible sourcing, right? All of this, I think, if I link back to the green financing, you know, as uh, we issue the SFL or SLB, right? All of those uh, KPI or action list is already uh, incorporated into those three KPI that we we commit that we will deliver, right? And uh, if we're talking about the use of proceed green finance, I think, uh, you know, uh, it is still relevant where we need to prove on the use of proceed for the benefit of improving the climate change and bio, biodiversity. So, so on the product side, I think the what they are available in the market is, is still relevant, relevant to this topic, right? Yeah. Absolutely agreed. Uh, Aris, would you like to add your opinions? Uh, yeah, just, uh, you know, to the extent that uh, when looking at any uh, any credit or any any debt uh, structure uh, obviously as an investor you know you you want some assurance that um, the company is going to have cash flow to pay for it right that, that that's the fundamental part of it right um, so 
uh, bringing in what Cedric was saying on the on the generation of, of carbon credits, uh, you know, this could be interesting because, of course, it just means that these bonds then become more secure, right? You you've you've got this cash flow coming off from uh, you know potential carbon credits, like if you channel certain bonds to two projects, uh, you know, for bi biodiversity, you know, specifically focused on on biodiversity, right? So I see a link there where you can you can go and you you, you know you you evaluate the underlying carbon credits that, that you know a biodiverse project uh, creates a you know natural capital uh, uh, forest, for example, creates. Um, you know, how do you finance it initially? Well, then you know you go in and you issue these these bonds that are quite specialized and focus on on that so yeah i, I see the situation where it could quite, quite well be a very different type of bond that may you know need to tick different types of boxes but uh you know at the end of the day the goals are, are very similar right they certainly are aligned to you know the umbrella let's call it of uh of uh, green bonds right again i i just want to say uh you know we, we can get hung up here in terms of the the details of each one of these structures and whether it should be compartmentalized or, you know, treated more more holistically. Uh, at the end of the day, you know, I, I really, I reiterate all the stuff that I said before in terms of, you, you know, that, that there is an availability of of, uh, of funds, of capital, right? This is, this is a great time to sort of, you know, go out there, investors are looking for opportunities. Uh, so certainly this is a good time to sort of go out there and, and, and channel these funds to to you know projects that are that are going to make a difference that are going to move the dial right and and let's again let's you know you can go for this perfect sort of structure standardized etc cetera, etc cetera, but you know don't make don't make the perfect be the enemy of the very good right there's a lot of stuff that we can do between now and you know tomorrow right so let's let's get out there and you know start putting some of these green bonds in in place transition bonds you know creating this uh, these initiatives being part of these initiatives like the uh, the carbon credit trading initiatives etc right all of these things work in the same direction we're all we're all pulling in the same direction now thank you thank you Harris. I would now like to invite our panelists to offer any closing notes as we will be ending shortly. So perhaps Kunyong Yu, if you start. Um, maybe I speak on the issuer side, right? I would like to see the market to develop into the level that, you know, we can differentiate between the company that have this kind of ESG focus and they should be able to to gain the benefit right because they they care for the world they already spend a lot of money right that that one part right and who do not do all of these things we should have some kind of penal life so that you know the cost of doing this good thing will go to the one that not doing this right so that you know we will be at the more uh, fair paying gal, you know, so that uh, this product or the market can be developed. Yep. Thank you, Kim Young Yud, and thank you for your uh, thorough answers and your presentation. Patrick, I'd now like to share the floor with you. Sure. So I would say we have to be realistic. We have a major problem on our hands, which is climate change and its consequences, and COVID is part of it. Uh, but like uh, was said, there is capital to answer this problem. And uh, there are going to be big changes in uh, the way we, we do things. Uh, for example, electric cars will come on our roads. Uh, public transportation will increase. Uh, renewable energy will become uh, more prevalent and cheaper. So this is an opportunity to, to create new ways of doing things, new businesses. And, uh, and it's, a, it's an opportunity for innovation. And uh, uh, everybody is asking for new things, new sustainability products. The consumer wants to understand the traceability of where the, the products are coming from. It was reminded uh, through the presentation of Kun Yong Yut about you know, where, where the products are coming from. It's very important. And our societies will be changing. The capital is there. Thailand is ready for it. And uh, you know we are here to help you if you want more information, more guidance, more introduction to the right people to help you in your capital raising efforts. Thank you, Cedric, for both your words and your actions. Um, 
Harris, I'd like to end with you. Yeah, um, I don't have any, much more to add. Uh, just to, again, just reinforce what you were saying. Uh, I do think uh, these are exciting times. Yes, uh, there are challenges, uh, and uh, they are they are severe challenges. However, you know, again, I think we we are finding solutions. We will continue to find solutions. Uh, I I I'm of the opinion you always you you leave a certain room. For, for innovation and, and you know, you, you just leave it there in the corner and see, you know, what develops there. Uh, and I think, uh, you know, there, there, there are a lot of things that are, are developing sort of uh, naturally uh, by, them, by themselves. Um, so uh, again, consumers are becoming more, uh, more discerning in terms of the products that they purchase. So I think that will, to some extent, solve Kun uh, Yong Yong. It's, it's a, a good question, right? You you go out there and it is it is a matter of obviously, you know, these, these are all the good, the good things, things that we're doing as far as sustainability is concerned. And I think you will see the benefit of that uh, through the, you know, the, the, the products that you sell. You, you do have people going out there buying your products for that reason as well. Again, we, we talk about this idea of uh, people are not just buying goods and services anymore just for the sake of it. Uh, they are buying because they are, are identifying with those those goods and services. So to the extent that, you know, again, you have a, a younger generation as well that really is, is getting behind this message and identifying, you know, with uh, the fight against climate change and, uh, and social issues, et cetera. I think it, 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 there's a lot of natural stuff that, that will happen uh, in, in that space. So, yeah, I'll leave it at that. And thanks again for, for the invitation to speak today. Thank you, Aris. I do feel optimistic. I hope our audience feels as uplifted as I do. Um, and thank you very much to TMA for hosting us today. TMA, I would love to hand the floor back to you. Thank you very much, Mr. Dekretari and our panelists. Now, we have come to the end of our third afternoon. So I would like to express the appreciation and also our supportive sponsors, Bangja Corporation Public Company Limited. Bangkok Bank Public Company Limited, Metagro Public Company Limited, Gasikon Bank Public Company Limited, PTT Public Company Limited, Sime Commercial Bank Public Company Limited, SCG, Entire Oil Public Company Limited. And we would appreciate if you could complete the evaluation form and provide us your feedback by clicking questionnaire button below. You will also receive a follow-up email with a link of today's webinar record and the presentations of our speakers. Lastly, please stay tuned for the upcoming program, the fifth event of TMA ESD series, CVC for SDGs, on the 5th of October, 2021. We'll bring together the experts to provide understanding of the benefits of utilizing the CVC infrastructure, capital, and innovative ventures that directly contribute towards the SDG. For now, on behalf of TMA, I would like to thank you for joining us today and see you again on 5th October. Please keep an eye on our events. Thank you. Sadika. Sadika.